Hey everybody, we are going to start talking about energetic anatomy. So we're going to go through the different aspects or pieces of the energy anatomy, and then we can do questions after the fact. Right. So when we are looking at the body's processes and the body's ability to heal, what fuels the body's processes is energy. This is called by different names in, in different traditions. In the, the Chinese and Japanese traditions, it's chi or ki. Um, in India, it's referred to as prana. Uh, in the Hebrew tradition, it's, it's rua or ruh. Um, in the Polynesian cultures, it's mana. And basically what we're talking about that fuels the body's processes is life force. So whenever you hear somebody talking about energy, it is basically they're talking about life force. When you're talking about energy healing, for example, it's the transference of, of energy or the transference of energy that can be used for life force. So with that, let's go through and talk about some of the different aspects of the energy anatomy. First, you have what you would call the aura. So the aura is the energetic mold or blueprint that eventually the body follows. So things happen in the mold or blueprint before they physicalize. So health issues, be it good health or bad health, are actually in the aura before the issues turn up in the body. So by systematically going through and cleansing out the, the negative aspects out of the energy body and setting healthy patterns, you can actually change or shift the energetic mold or blueprint that the physical body follows. If you think about the aura, you're basically kind of swimming in this pool of energy, a lot like a goldfish in a bowl of water. You know, the fish is the fish, but the water around it, you could see as it's the energetic mold or blueprint that it's swimming around. And so the health of the fish is going to be dependent on how clean that water is. Same thing happens for your energy body or your aura. So again, remember, the aura is an energetic mold or blueprint that uh, your physical body follows. There's also a component for your emotional body, there's a component for your mental body, and then eventually a component for your causal body, which is associated with the incarnated soul. But a lot of times for physical healing, we're talking uh, about the mold or blueprint known as the aura. Then from there, we have what we call the health aura or health rays. Now, these are little perpendicular lines that come out from the pores of your skin and come out um, uh, perpendicular from the body. So if you've seen pictures of uh, Mother Mary or Lord Ganesha, and there's all those lines that look like, um, like uh, little flares coming off the sun, um, these are what you would call the health rays. And so this is dependent on uh, how vibrant your body is. Like if the health rays are really strong, the body is very, very vibrant. If the health rays are weakened or entangled, the body can be very weak. And so think of it like this. Your health rays is your energy body's ability to absorb new healthy prana from the environment and expel old dirty energy out. So basically it's a way for your 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 energy body to breathe, like it inhales and exhales. It inhales healthy, good prana. It exhales old, dirty, used up energy or prana. And so when the body is compromised, like say you have a, a bad hip, for example, if you look around that hip clairvoyantly, the health rays in that area are shortened, droopy, and a little bit entangled. And so your body's ability to absorb energy into that area is compromised, which also contributes to the degeneration of that particular area. When you open up the health rays in these particular areas, it slows down the rate of degeneration because you are giving the body the fuel to heal and, and um, support the body's processes in, in that area. 
So a lot of times when we're approaching things here, we're treating it both physically and energetically. You know, most oils are going to clean up the aura a bit and clean up the health rays, but things that are very specific to a degenerating joint, like one of the oils that's really great for opening up the health rays is helichrysum. And so we use helichrysum for a lot of different issues. Energetically, you would use it to clean up and straighten the health rays. And so anytime there is a health issue, the health rays are always impacted. They shorten, they droop, they get entangled. And if you think a really good example of this is like, say you have the flu, you go through the cycle of the virus, and then usually there's a little bit of a bacterial infection afterwards, and you get over the virus, the bacteria, but still you're, you're a little bit tired, you're a little bit melancholy, you know, your, your energy is just not what it normally is. And the issue with that is your body has fought off the virus, it has fought off the bacteria, but your energy body, the health rays in particular, have been shortened and tangled and droopy. So your body's ability to recuperate and revitalize itself has been hindered because of the compromise in the, in the health rates. And so when, whenever we go through and we're doing different protocols, we're always trying to clean the aura and clean the health rays. It's built into the protocols. But this just helps you to understand the mechanics behind what we're doing energetically. Now, from there, we also have energetic links to, to things in our past, to people, and to people that maybe are negative towards us or that we don't like. You know, people that we love or people that are close to us, we have energetic connections that are very, very strong. The negative connections to, to people that we, you know, maybe have conflicts with or even people that we love where there's a little bit of conflict, negative cords can appear. And these cords look a little bit like an umbilical cord between two people where energy is flowing from greater to lesser. So if somebody's energy body is a little bit stronger, it's kind of feeding the energy of somebody who, who is maybe not so strong, or there's a transference is a better way of saying it, of energy between the two people. So I think there's been times where we've been around people and after the person leaves, you know, they're really enthusiastic, they're really upbeat, and you feel better, you feel uplifted, you have more energy, you want to get stuff done. There was a transference of energy. Then we have times where we interact with somebody and, you know, they're negative and, and you know, people refer to them sometimes as like energy vampires or, you know, however you want to call that. But basically, they're just sucking the energy from you. They're like, I kind of joke, they're sucking your will to live. It's just, they're draining your life force a little bit. And the issue is, you know, there is an unauthorized withdrawal from your energy body. And so part of the issue is there's cords there. And like I said, energy goes from greater to lesser. And so after you interact with somebody like that, the use of rue to disconnect from that person will keep you from getting drained. Now, this is an issue for people like chiropractors, massage therapists, acupuncturists, um, people who are having to interact with a lot of people on the phone, you know, people in human resources, um, team leaders, any of these kinds of things, you're going to have lots of connections or cords with people. And, you know, as far as the health practitioners, you know, people are trying to get better. So they see you as a copper top battery where, you know, they're not consciously doing it, but energy is, you know, they're being, cords are attached to you and energy is being drained from you a little bit, whether you like it or not. And um, sometimes the, the manifestation will just be um, inability to think or getting tired and fatigued when you sit down and rest, you fall asleep, things like that. It's usually a lot of cord connections. Um, so again, inhaling rue on a regular basis, especially at the end of the day, helps to disconnect these cords uh, from people. Um, St. John's wort also works. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but both will disconnect the cords. 
So you have the, the cords, you have the aura, and you have the health, health rings. Now, now there is the chakras, right? The chakras are energetic pumping stations that have specific areas that they are in charge of or that they affect. And so think of the chakras as these energetic pumping stations that are constantly going back and forth you know and in some some traditions they'll say that the chakra is spinning one way or spinning the other and that means something um, actually the chakras are constantly going back and forth if they were only going in one direction they would be um, a super significant health issue um, uh, probably death, you know, because the energy body would be so mal malfunctioning. And so the chakras are constantly absorbing, digesting, and distributing energy and prana to their specific parts of the body that they support. Now, each chakra has a, a physical component, an emotional, mental component, and a spiritual component. And so here we're going to talk more, of, well, I was going to say we're going to talk more about things physically, but we'll probably do all three, you know, knowing me. And so um, remember, the chakras are constantly absorbing, digesting, and distributing energy or prana to different parts of the body, right? They're constantly going back and forth. When they get more developed, they not only go back and forth like this, but they'll actually start pumping like this you know they'll they'll become a real powerhouse but that is when somebody's energy body is very big very strong for the average person they're just going back and forth now with the chakras there are different systems and different combinations a lot of traditions will focus on a seven chakra system um, this is very good. Um, a lot of times they'll associate a color like black for one, red, yellow, uh, green, white, blue, and purple, or like a paisley color. Um, each of the chakras have multiple colors in each of the centers. And so the black, red, yellow, white, green, all of that is more metaphorical. It's not actual. Like, for example, the heart chakra, a lot of times people in, in these situations will put green with the heart. The heart actually doesn't produce green. The heart produces pink and gold. Um, eventually, the, the heart doesn't produce green, but eventually a uh, sort of brilliant green comes through when somebody is super, super devotional and somewhat developed. But again, that's not an energy that the chakra is generating, that's actually an energy that's coming through that's from a deity. And so the seven chakra system is very good for using therapy, but it is actually a partial view. There's actually 11 chakras. And so when you look at the seven chakra system, what they do sometimes is they combine a few of the chakras. And so the seven chakra system is not wrong. It just is not complete. There's a few chakras that are, are not listed. And in the old days, in ancient times, this was done very much on purpose because if somebody didn't know what they were doing, they could cause harm by working on some of these energy centers that were left out or um, things weren't as refined as they are now. People sometimes could use the mechanics of energy to cause harm. And so sometimes these were not given to the public. They were considered inner teachings and it was a form of protection so that people would misuse the teachings. So the seven chakra system is not wrong. It's super, super valid. But here we're actually going to talk about the 11 centers, which is tied to the tree of life. The tree of life actually has 11 centers with one secret center, right? Different, different traditions will talk about this. So for example, when I was traveling with the medicine man, they do a thing called the sun dance where they erect this tree, they go down and cut down a tree and carry it back to their arbor where they're doing ceremony. And they dig a big hole in the ground and they fill it with rocks. And then they set this tree in the ground and put rocks around it. 
so that the tree is never truly touching the, the ground. You know, it's basically touching these rocks, but they say this tree that's for the ceremony is not touching the ground because the roots go to God. So basically the tree of life is the chakras. And it's really a tree that's more of an upside down tree with the roots going to God or being fed by God. Now your physical body is actually fed by the, by the earth. And then the emotional mental body is, is fed by the, the connection to the higher soul. So in different traditions, these aspects of the tree of life um, have different amount of centers depending on their philosophy and what, what and how they're teaching. Like in the Hindu tradition, there are some, some writings that say there's a city where they see nine gates, nine gates. So that means they're talking about nine centers. And then uh, in the outer Kabbalistic teachings, they talk about 10 centers. When they talk about the inner Kabbalistic teachings, they actually talk about 11 centers, the throat being a secret center. And the reason why the throat is a secret center is that it's the, the bridge or the void that um, connects the higher soul with the incarnated soul. So we'll be talking about that here very shortly. Then um, in, in Revelations in the back of the Bible, John says, I see a tree that bears 12 fruits, right? So the 12th fruit is actually 12 inches above the head, which is the point of light or the incarnated soul. In a person that's very, very developed, like highly, highly developed, that comes uh, from a point of light, it changes into a small ball. And then eventually it turns into a bud. And then eventually it turns into a chakra, right? And so for, for us, it's more a point of light. But when it's a great, great soul, like a great, great saint, um, it's usually a chakra above the head. When they say Lord Padmasambhava, who is the being that brought Buddhism to Tibet, they say he was born on a lake of fire. So that is a highly activated uh, crown chakra but it's also a highly developed and activated uh, 12th chakra. So they say when he was born, um, uh, no one was um, worthy of being his teacher because he was already born realized. You know, he came to, to help humanity and he was born with a super activated 12th chakra. In the, in the Buddhist tradition, they say Lord Buddha was born at eight years old. Now, obviously, uh, the Buddha wasn't born with an eight-year-old body. What they're talking about is the development of the incarnated soul. For the incarnated soul, the point of light above the head, to be shown as an eight-year-old, that is the level or development of a Buddha. If it was around seven, it would be what you would call a, a bodhisattva or a messiah. At the age of six, it would be um, a chohan, um, a great, great uh, spiritual teacher. Um, age five would be a holy master. Um, age four would be like the disciples around Christ or the disciples around the Lord Buddha, which were known as arhats. In the Yogananda tradition, Yogananda is referred to as Paramahansa Yogananda, and Paramahansa is the equivalent to a Arhat or uh, level four stage of development, a very, very, very developed soul. Um, when we're a point of light, we're not really an age, we're more like a fetus still in the mother's womb. You know, we're still in the process of developing. When we really start to develop, eventually we'll become a one-year-old. And that is really us really stepping on the path and, and stepping away from the normal everyday worldly life and starting the stage of development. And then, you know, as time goes by, a two-year-old, eventually a three-year-old and so on. So sometimes you'll see in the Hindu tradition, you'll see Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna looks like he's seven or eight and he's like playing a flute or, or 
you know, doing something of that manner. It's not showing that he's uh, immature. It's showing that he's very, very, very developed because he's the age of a seven or eight year old. And so um, this symbolizes different ages or stages of development. So when they say the Lord Buddha was born at eight, um, uh, that was already a highly, highly developed soul. Um, the Lord Buddha was a really big deal because um, that was the first time that a uh, being from earth reached uh, Buddhahood. You know, there's other Buddhas um, uh, that were before him, but they were not of the earth plane. And so, yeah, enough of that. We'll, we'll move on. We're supposed to be talking about chakras. So let's go through and talk about chakras. So first, let's talk about location. We're going to talk about the crown chakra. The crown chakra is the top of the head. Right? This is the entry point for divine energy. This is the entry point of soul energy. This is when you pray. This is where the energy comes in. Um, it also affects the brain, and it also affects the pineal gland, which is in the center of your head. The root of the chakra um, actually goes all the way down, in, and the root comes down to the pineal gland. So the surface of the chakra extends out from the body, and then it comes down like a funnel and goes down into your central channel, which is in runs through the top of your head all the way down through the body and comes out through the floor of your pelvis. So each of the chakras, the root goes into the central channel. So this is how they're being fed both from your, your spiritual development and the soul energy and then also from the earth prana that's coming up from the earth entering up through the floor of the pelvis. Okay, so um, Spiritually speaking, the crown chakra has to do with oneness, oneness. So when the crown chakra is developed, a greater level or sense of oneness is what you're beginning to experience. It's also the center for unconditional love, right? Unconditional love. You love people that you don't know. You love people that are causing you harm. You're, you love people no matter what. So this is actually the true source of compassion. Compassion is if you're suffering, your suffering is, is my suffering. That is from the crown chakra. Um, this would also be tied to knowing through direct perception. It's a type of clairvoyance where you actually don't see the form, but you receive the information. You know, the information comes to you and you just know the answer instantly, but you didn't have to translate what you're seeing. This is the crown chakra. Um, it is also the will to serve. You know, it is tied to the upper level of will, and it has to do with doing service for others. And as that part of the will develops, eventually you're serving the higher soul. So this is all associated with the crown chakra. Now, from the crown chakra, we go to the forehead, which is where the hairline is or should be. And so with, with that, the forehead is tied to access to the inner world, access to the spiritual world. It has to do with uh, awareness or sustained awareness. It sees things in a big picture. It's tied to the nervous system, also to parts of the brain and also to the pineal gland. So again, brain, nervous system, and pineal gland. And um, again, tied to intuitive intelligence. So the crown chakra is tied to knowing through direct perception. You're getting information without really seeing something. You just, boom, you have the information in your head. The forehead chakra is clairvoyance, but with form. Like you see the energy around the body, you see the aura, you see the health rays. You see the spiritual cord. So this is clairvoyance, but with form. So if you were to look at the two types, say two people were standing there and looking at an elephant. You know, you're looking at an elephant and one person is blind and one person can see. The person that can see looks over and says, oh, look, that's an elephant. That is 
instant information, and that would be what you consider knowing through direct perception. The person who's blind, they walk up to the elephant, they go, okay, it's very big, the skin is thick, it has big ears, it has, has a big trunk or nose, and based on all these pieces of information, most likely this is an elephant. So that information has to be translated, right? This is clairvoyance with form. You know, you're basically translating what you see and figuring out what you see, right? So the forehead is sustained awareness, access to the inner world, spiritual world. Um, it is very big picture thinking. Like if you space out and daydream and look out the window, it's big forehead and other centers aren't so activated, you know. Uh, sometimes when somebody has a big forehead, they might be intuitive, but have a hard time putting things into action, right? Now, from there, we move to the area between the eyebrows. This is what we call the Ajna, right? The Ajna. The Ajna is the master chakra. It regulates all the other chakras. It synchronizes all the other chakras and sequences them. Um, it is energy of thought. It is where a lot of thought and emotion can be generated psychologically. You know, whenever you think something, it produces an emotion. And whenever you feel something, it produces a thought. So thoughts and emotions are really just two sides of the same coin. They're psychological energies. But there's also uh, psych uh, physiological emotions that will produce thoughts that come from the lower centers. And so this is tied more to the psychology of the upper centers, right? So this is the master chakra. This has to do with focus. This has to do with the mental will or doing what's right. It's in charge of the endocrine system. It's in charge of the eyes. It's um, associated with the sinuses. It actually still impacts part of the brain. And the ajna and the forehead both balance each other. If the forehead's really big, the ajna shrinks, right? If the ajna gets really big and the person's really focused, they become less aware of their surroundings because the ajna is big and the forehead is shrinking. Right? So these two balance each other. And um, somebody with an ajna is able to get things done, but if they're not aware of the people around them, they might do it in a way that's a little bit abrasive. Not necessarily wrong, just can be a little bit willful and to the point. Right? The ajna has to do with understanding new and abstract information and the ability to apply it. Right? So when the ajna is developed, a person can be exposed to a new piece of information and very quickly go, oh, I can do this, 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 and this with it. This is how I apply it. And they can also express it and talk about it. So the ajna is tied to abstract thinking, and it's also tied to forming strategies. You know, uh, reactions aren't strategies, they're just a reaction. You might take an action, but there's no thought that goes into it. The ability to think something out, think about the consequences, think about how you're gonna get there is all tied to the ajna. It's the formation of strategy to eventually take action. And so that is tied to the ajna and you could call the ajna the directing factor or the CEO of your energy body. Now, the crown, the forehead, and the ajna are all three of those are tied to the higher soul, right? From the heart down is tied to the incarnated soul or the lower realm, but the first three are tied to the higher soul. So the throat is actually considered um, a secret energy center or a secret chakra because the throat is tied to the abyss or the void between the incarnated soul and the higher soul. And so with this, as the throat becomes developed, which the development comes from uh, energy moving up, 
right? Energy moving up from the lower centers and then rising up to your crown and then eventually out of your head. This actually helps to develop the rainbow bridge or the bridge of light. And so the throat chakra is tied to higher creativity. It's tied to lower mental thinking. Like when you went to school and you studied all the information that you studied and you memorized it and you had your experiences and you make decisions based on the experiences, this is um, coming from the throat chakra or it's the form of knowledge, right? So the throat sees everything in pieces. The ajna, the center between the eyebrows, can form strategy because it sees the big picture and then allocates different resources to put the strategy in place. The throat chakra sees things in pieces, but doesn't see the big picture. So it's very good for critical thinking, going over details, but as far as forming strategies, you're always looking towards the past, your past experiences. Well, this happened, that happened, and this is what I should do. Now, if it's not regulated by some of the upper centers, a lot of times when somebody's primarily driven by the throat center for mental activity, they'll have a hard time making a decision, you know? They'll go back and forth, well, this has this, this quality, this has this quality, uh, should I do this, should I do that? If I do this, then I don't get that. If I do that, I don't get this. You go back and forth going over the details, but you have a hard time making the decision. And it's because you don't see the big picture. The Ajna can make a decision and even if it's wrong, because of the, what the Ajna does, it has the ability to adjust and adapt to a wrong decision and form a new strategy or adjust the strategy. But the throat chakra just sees details and is isolated. So what can happen with the throat is paralysis through overanalysis. You know, you keep grinding on details, but you're not able to make a decision or you're overwhelmed by making a decision. Too, too much throat, not enough Ajna, right? So the Ajna and the throat make up the mental body. Your forehead and crown contribute as well, but a lot of people, it's the throat and the Ajna. You know, it's lower mental thinking and then strategic thinking combined. If you look at um, a genius, a genius is a flash of intuition that comes in through the crown. The forehead is able to absorb that flash. And then the area between the eyebrows is able to take that new piece of information, process it, and apply it. So the forehead chakra is wisdom. The area between the eyebrows, ajna, is understanding. And the throat is knowledge. And so if you look at a genius, there's the flash of intuition or knowing through direct perception comes in, the forehead observes it, right? And then the ajna goes through and processes that information. So in a way, you could say the ajna is processed wisdom, right? Then the throat goes through and validates the, the processed wisdom to show the details of what has been realized. So a genius, all four aspects are in play. All four aspects are being developed. Now, if you're somebody who's very good at details but has a hard time with strategy, then, you know, say you're in a business, you hire somebody that can do strategy. You don't feel that you need to do all of them. We usually are very strong in one aspect, but maybe not in all of them. You know, somebody who's a CEO is very good at directing things and putting strategies in place. But if you ask them details, they don't know the details very well because they're always in strategic thinking and looking at the big picture. And so if you're looking at a business, you want to have all aspects there. If you look at when there's been big breakthroughs in science, um, a lot of it was the flash of intuition the awareness of, of what happened, the ability to process it and apply it, and then to go through and test it and validate what has happened. Right? So even things that are breakthroughs in science still follow these mechanical formulas. Now, the heart is the center of the chest, but when we get to the heart, there is a front and a back. The front is the center of the chest, the back is the area between your shoulder blades. That is the back heart. The front heart is associated with 
the physical heart and also the thymus, the thymus gland. The back heart is the heart and the thymus gland, but it's also your circulation through your body. And it is also tied to the lungs. So the front heart is not tied to the lungs, but the back heart is. Now, the heart is the entry point for something to come in and enter into the lower realm or your physical, your physical form or body, right? So if you look at a lot of spiritual traditions, it's about developing the heart. It's how you get something in. So the heart is tied to, to integration. It's tied to um, be, being able to sit and feel like um, the truth of something, you know, like when you feel like, oh, that feels true to me, that feels, that feels pretty solid. That is coming from the heart, you know. The heart can tell what's false and what's true, and the heart will actually clean it up and transmute it so that things that are negative, if you hold it in the heart long enough, things that are, are negative or inaccurate actually start to fall away. So the heart is actually tied to emotional transmutation. You know, it transmutes things emotionally. So the heart center is associated with love, with compassion, with patience, with tolerance, uh, with loving kindness, mercy, all these aspects of uh, forgiveness, all these aspects are tied to uh, the heart chakra. Now, the heart chakra can have negative components. Um, you know, forms of hatred can come from the heart. Sadness and grief are, are usually in the back heart. Um, other lower emotions are actually coming from the solar plexus, which is also part of the emotional body. So the heart, again, is uh, about others, right? The solar plexus is about the self. The heart is about others. You know, so your relationships, your connections, how other people feel. So again, patience, tolerance, um, loving kindness, mercy, you know, just love for the people around you. All of this comes from, from the heart center. Then you go down to the solar plexus, which is down below your ribs, and then also below your shoulder blades on the backside. So there is a front and a back. This is all of your, uh, well, most, I should say, of your internal organs in your abdominal cavity. So it's also tied to your diaphragm, which is at the bottom of your rib cage. And the backside is tied a bit more to the pancreas, to the liver, um, and to body tension, right? When you have a lot of body tension, um, this is uh, actually a super congested back solar plexus. So if something is upsetting to you right off the bat, it's more in the front solar plexus. You know, after 15 minutes, an hour, maybe two hours, it'll shift to the back solar plexus. So the back solar plexus can get congested really quite easily because of the normal wear and tear of everyday life. Now, the solar plexus is your lower emotions. So anger, irritation, frustration, disappointment, all of these things are the solar plexus. Um, the tendency to sabotage yourself, solar plexus. You know, anything that you can think of that's negative is the solar plexus. Now, there's positive things, positive emotions and tendencies that come from the solar plexus. The ability to commit comes from the solar plexus. The sense of fairness, comes from the solar plexus. The, the drive for balance that comes from the solar plexus. Um, uh, a sense of justice that's actually also associated with the solar plexus. So in, the, in, in times like in the Old West where the sheriff had a five-pointed star and you know was the law enforcement in that area, that is tied to the solar plexus. It's basically the ability to compare and choose or to see things black and white. So if you think about law enforcement, things are either black or white. They're either wrong or they're right. There's no gray area. Either you broke the law or you didn't break the law, right? So the aspect of law is associated with the solar plexus. Okay, the solar plexus is also um, kind of the true star of David. 
because the, all the upper centers are the heart up and all the lower centers are the navel down. The solar plexus is actually directly in the middle and is considered a higher chakra and a lower chakra. You know, it's one that goes both ways. And so for energy to move up and down that central channel, it's really dependent on how clean and how open and how developed that solar plexus is. And so when, when that is developed, more energy is able to run up and down the channels. The heart is about other people, the solar plexus is about the self, right? It's about the self. So um, for this to be developed, people are usually um, uh, uh, self-motivated. You know, uh, another emotion that comes from the solar plexus is enthusiasm or, or being enthusiastic. Um, the ability to have constancy of aim, you know, for, for the ability to commit. And really, when you're developing the emotional body, you want to have a balance of both the heart and the solar plexus. Sometimes when we're on the spiritual path, we, we do too much heart. Well, not too much, but the heart's developed and the solar plexus usually isn't as developed. If you look like sometimes normal everyday life or people in the business world, the solar plexus is very developed. Sometimes the heart's not as developed, but you actually want to do both. And so the way that you could look at this is, you know, somebody comes up to you and uh, asks you for something and somebody with a super developed heart and the solar plexus isn't developed, they'll give you the shirt off their back, even if it's their last shirt, right? Then you go to the next person and you ask for help. And it's somebody from, uh, that has a very developed solar plexus and maybe not as developed heart. They'll want the shirt off your back, even if it's the last shirt, right? So the goal is to have a healthy balance of the two healthy self-interest and healthy interest in, in others, right? You, you want to be too excessively one or the other. It's okay for you to take care of yourself, uh, but it's also necessary for you to be concerned with the people around you or concerned for others, okay? So from the, the solar plexus, we go down to the navel, the navel, which is your belly button area. Now, your navel is the controlling chakra for your lower centers, right? Your lower centers. So everything that's considered your lower nature is controlled and regulated with the navel chakra in conjunction with the area between your eyebrows or the ajna. So the navel has to do with um, instinct, like your instinct. Like if I was to pick something up and throw it over at Samantha. Samantha wouldn't think and process like, oh, there's a, a ball coming towards my head. I should probably move my head. She'd move her head and then say, what are you doing? You know, but the first thing she'd do is she'd move her head. That is instinct. You know, you're acting without thinking. You know, you're doing something that is um, potentially for your survival without having to process it through the brain. And it's tied to um, your appendix and it's tied to your lower part of your digestive tract, especially your small intestine. And so this is tied Kabbalistically to what they call beauty or building the golden body. And so the navel chakra takes energy from all these different areas and then it synthesizes a new energy or a um, uh, synthetic form of energy. Synthetic doesn't mean fake or false. It means things have been combined to synthesize something and then it starts to change your aura. And the reason why this chakra is referred to as beauty is it starts to um, produce what we call the golden body. Your aura goes from the color of lead and is turned to a golden color. Now, this makes you more conductive to the higher soul. When the aura becomes golden, more energy can come down and more energy can pass through. And so when you go into temples sometimes and the statues are painted gold or you see a painting and like a Buddha and it's gold, it's actually showing that that being is developed the golden body to a substantial degree. 
You know, the golden body isn't the end all, it's just a step. You know, eventually you, you develop the rainbow body or what you'd call the diamond body. But that, that comes after the golden body has been built for a very long time. For most of us, we're trying to build the golden body. So this is tied to the navel, you know, or beauty, divine beauty. Then we go over to the left-hand side below the ribs, you know, kind of in the center. Like if you were to put a finger in the middle and a finger on your side, in the middle of that and below the ribs is the spleen area, right? The spleen. Now the spleen is tied to um, what they would call power or victory. Um, it's also the source of unconscious desires. Now the spleen chakra draws in energy from the environment and specifically air prana and distributes it to all the chakras like all over the body. So your overall vitality is tied both to the navel and also to the spleen chakra, right? And so the spleen chakra is um, also associated with the lymphatic system. Um, the spleen is the biggest lymphatic organ where the throat chakra actually regulates the lymphatic system. The spleen has to do with the lymphatic system, but it also has to do with killing like viruses and bacteria, breaking up red blood cells when they're old, things like this. So it is your overall uh, vitality. It's your level or degree of endurance. And it is your push to overcome obstacles in life to, again, make your spiritual connections to a higher degree. Like if you look at somebody who's very driven by their spleen, they overcome obstacles by pushing through. Like a good example of somebody who has a developed spleen chakra is like somebody like a conqueror. You know, it could be somebody spreading uh, good things or a military leader who's doing bad things. It's still the, the spleen is the driving force or the ability to push through obstacles. You know, no matter what, they're gonna overcome it through constant energy and effort, right? This is tied to the spleen chapter or power or victory. Now you go to your low back area. Your low back opposite the navel on the back side it is called the Ming Men. The Ming Men. The Ming Men is constantly taking energy from their lower centers, mostly the basic chakra, and shooting it up high. So it's how prana gets spread throughout the whole body. It um, especially feeds the energy up to the upper centers. Um, the Ming Men is tied to the low back. It's tied to your kidneys. It's tied to your adrenals. It's also tied to your blood pressure and circulation. It's tied to circulation of lymph through your body. Um, when it is in negative, it could be also like a source of aggression, um, a center for resentment. Um, this is also a center for transmutation. The heart transmutes things emotionally. The crown transmutes things mentally. The Ming Min transmutes things physically. So when you're physically transmuting the physiological emotions that the body generates, Part of how they get um, transmuted is through the Ming Men. Sometimes they're partially transmuted through the back heart, but mostly it's through the Ming Men. And so the Ming Men is known as um, uh, glory, or sometimes they'll say um, majesty, like the majesty. But a lot of times in the Bible or in the Old Testament, they'll say glory be to God right? They're basically saying these negative things I transmute and I offer up to God. So in the Essene tradition, they would refer to this process that where we go Ming Men, back heart and crowned as feeding the gods, you know, because you're offering these things up, you're transmuting them, and you're offering your lower physiological drives, you're transmuting them and offering them up to God, and the cultivation of virtue and morals, 
happening. So the Ming Min also is tied to um, accurate perception. You would think accurate perception would be like in the upper chakras in the head or, or maybe even the heart, but the Ming Min is actually tied to accurate perception. And if you think about it, if the Ming Min is dirty and then is shooting dirty energy up, it causes contamination in the head or contamination in the heart. So uh, when you go through and you're transmitting things um, in the Ming Min, you are changing the, the emotional state by transmuting the lower physiological emotions so that you can have higher emotions and more proper thoughts. If these things aren't transmuted, then your, your physiological emotions impact your emotions and affect your thought processes. Because remember, if you feel something, you produce a thought. And if you think something, you produce an emotion. So if your physiological emotions aren't transmuted you know the drive for hunger thirst you know avoidance of pain all these things are are physiological emotions that um, get generated by the body if they're not transmuted eventually they make it up into your mental body and your brain and you form a thought process based on these lower emotions you know and so if you think about it somebody who you could care about and like you know, they might do something wrong, they might do something that hurts your feeling, and all of a sudden they go from being somebody you care about and love to somebody that you don't like, and, you know, you start saying things like, I don't know, they're evil, I think they might be the devil, you know, you come up with these stories because you got hurt, right? The resentment hasn't been transmuted, it's in the Ming Min, so eventually that turns into an emotional response psychologically, and then eventually it starts to affect your thought processes, where you start coming up with stories based on these physiological emotional responses. And so with that, the unconscious desires are in the spleen, but in the Ming Min is where they either go down for coming into materialization or they move up to be transmuted. So depending on what it is, um, you know, if we transmute them, then we're with healthier, happier thoughts. Okay, so from the Ming Min, we go to the sex chakra, which is where the sex organs are. So this is tied to the sex organs and the reproductive system. And it's also about 30% of the energy goes to the legs, right? Goes to the legs. Part of the energy also rises up and has uh, an impact on activating the heart, um, activating the throat and feeding the brain, right? Feeding the brain. And so with this, the, the sex chakra is tied to lower creativity or creativity in the physical world. It's not just about having babies. It's also about attracting energy from the environment. So that energy of thought that comes from the Ajna is mixed with energy from the environment to bring a thought into a thought form, right? Into a thought form. So the sex chakra actually attracts the energy from the environment and helps begin the mixing process of energy from the environment with thought energy to create a thought form. So the, the Kabbalistic name for the sex chakra is the foundation, the foundation for the physical world. Then you have the basic chakra. The basic chakra is bones, muscle, and blood. A little bit of kidneys, a little bit of adrenals, but basically bones, muscle, and blood. So this is your will to survive. This is your ability to be practical. This is your ability to have constancy of effort. If the basic chakra is not developed, the tendency will be procrastination. The, the ability to be practical goes away and the person might become a little bit delusional or have, have stories in their head. Um, you know, they have a break from reality. Somebody who is able to get things done and be super, super practical has a very big basic chakra. Um, if you give somebody with a big basic chakra something to do, 
and they're super busy, they'll tell you either, no, I can't do it, or they'll put it down in a schedule because they're going to make it happen. You know, they're so busy, so they got to figure out where to fit it in. So, for example, you know, your chakras are like muscles. And when, when you don't use them or use them improperly, they, they either develop or start to become um, underdeveloped you know, um, they start to become dormant. And so I noticed on days, and this is many years ago, on days that I just got up out of bed, I got a lot of stuff done. Even if I hit the snooze button once, I still got a lot of stuff done. But if I hit it twice, I was just a little lethargic through the day. If I hit it three times, I did not get anything done. And the reason why is um, hitting the snooze button three times, I'm procrastinating. And so after a period of time, what happens is the basic keeps shrinking, it keeps shrinking. And then pretty soon when it comes time to get things done, the basics not big enough and you have a hard time getting things done because you don't have that constancy of effort. So the basic chakra is tied to prosperity, abundance, the ability to get things done or constancy of effort. It's the ability to be practical. It's um, the ability to be realistic is all tied to the basic chakra. The will to survive is tied to the basic chakra. So in Kabbalistic teachings, this is the kingdom. This is tied to the physical form. All the other chakras are considered masculine and the basic chakra is considered feminine. And the reason is the basic chakra is considered feminine is it's tied to the physical form or it has a condensation effect on the energy of the life force and the soul energy. The other chakras are all uh, expansive in nature and are trying to get into the basic chakra. So that's why they're masculine and the, the basic chakra is feminine. So the basic chakra is tied to kundalini energy or the sacred fire and the awakening of the kundalini energy and the sacred fire, which also then feeds the other chakras. So for kundalini to be activated, you come in through the top of the head. Eventually the energy mixes with the basic chakra and then goes back up for kundalini to activate uh, divine energy has to come down or soul energy has to come down and mix with the kundalini energy for it to rise up as it rises up the chakras get bigger and they start pumping more now in the seven chakra system uh, you could look at it symbolically like snow white and the seven dwarfs the the dwarfs represent um the seven chakras and they're they're dwarves because they're underdeveloped because the kundalini hasn't gone up and they're also dwarves because if you think of dwarves they're they're always digging and going down into the earth so they're tied to the the earth you know they're tied to the the physical form that's tied to the earth snow white represents um, the kundalini energy you know it would be the feminine aspect or the princess the prince represents the the higher soul the king would represent the divine spark which is above the higher soul but the, it's the higher soul that is coming down and waking up the princess so if you think of the story of snow white and the seven dwarfs the prince comes down and kisses snow white snow white wakes up and then if you look at the Walt Disney version of Snow White, when the princess wakes up, when Snow White wakes up, all the dwarves become their better selves and they all become much brighter. And then if you think about what Snow White does, she cleans the house and feeds the dwarves. And that's the nature of divine energy coming down, mixing with the basic, awakening kundalini, is there's greater soul contact. And when there's greater soul contact, the soul cleans the house and feeds the chakras. So the chakras become bigger. They become much bigger and they're cultivating the tendencies, the spiritual tendencies of each of the chakras. Now, if you look at the seven dwarfs, the basic chakra is sleepy, right? Sleepy. And if you think of sleepy or an underdeveloped basic chakra, it's the tendency to procrastinate, sit on the couch, not get anything done. But when it becomes developed and activated, it's constancy of effort and the ability 
to, to be practical and realistic, right? Then the sex chakra for the dwarves is bashful, right? Bashful. It's because, you know, he's, he's um, uh, bashful is like a, a malfunctioning or underdeveloped sex chakra, right? Then the lower emotions is grumpy, the, the dwarf grumpy, right? Then you go to the heart and the heart is happy. Like the heart is happy no matter what, you know, it's, it's um, even bad people, somebody who's really, really bad still loves somebody and they still have the ability to be happy. So the heart is the entry point of soul energy down into the form, regardless of how good or how bad a person is. Then you go to the throat, this is dopey. This is the lower mind. This is the part of the mind that, that learns from past experiences, right? Then you go to the area between the eyebrows. This is sneezy. Again, remember, it's tied to the sinuses. The, the Ajna chakra is also tied to your limbic system, your limbic system, which is something that we directly impact when we're inhaling the essential oils. And so this is tied to different responses and um, um, emotional responses and how we learn and grow. And so when it's malfunctioning, it's, you know, causing sinus issues, but um, I don't think they could come up with a good name for, uh, you know, the limbic system for the area between the eyebrows, so they stuck with sneezing. Then the entry point for divine energy is the crown chakra, so this would be Doc, you know, uh, through prayer and connection to the higher soul, that is our medicine, that is the doctor is connecting to the higher soul or connecting to a deity. So this is aspect is dog. So when you watch Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you're really watching the development of the chakras and somebody spiritually growing and evolving. So I hope this information helped you and um, hope to talk to you sometime soon. Take care.